I'm not sure if he really needs any detailed introduction, but I will nevertheless mention at least this, that Sheikh Omar Suleiman is the founder and the president of Al Yaqeen Institute, and he's also an adjunct professor at the Southern Methodist University, uh, Professor of Islamic Studies in the greater Dallas area. He's also the resident scholar at the Valley Ranch Islamic Center, my, my former home area, subhanAllah. And he's a co-chair of the Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square. Uh, listen to this, this is interesting, subhanAllah, and I, I didn't even know this. He holds a bachelor's in accounting, a bachelor's in Islamic law, a master's in Islamic finance, a master in political history, and is working, uh, is pursuing his PhD from the Islamic University of Malaysia on Islamic thought. You know, you think he would be stacking up the degrees or something. But most of all, subhanAllah, I am blessed to say that I, I truly love Sheikh Omar from the bottom of my heart. I'm sure as most of you do. So please give him a hand and, and give him your hearts and your ears and inshallah we will learn from Sheikh Omar. Please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa la'umwana illa ala zalameen. Wa la'aqibatu bil muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam mubarak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasiman kathira. MashaAllah, what an amazing slate of speakers. What an amazing program. What an amazing group of organizers and volunteers. And I want to take a moment, just in case I forget to do so at the end, and I know it's been done before I came up here, but to recognize the volunteers and the organizers. If you see their faces, if you ever pay attention, close enough attention, uh, you'll see stress, exhaustion, tiredness, nervousness, trying to make sure that every detail of the program is carried out as planned, and um, I think that we don't take the time, sometimes we just walk past them on the way out. So as you walk out after such an inspiring convention, please take a moment to actually say something encouraging to them. So even if you've got to line up in front of the volunteers, uh, you know, 20 people to a volunteer, they've heard enough uh, of criticism and, and maybe, you know, uh, asks and, and orders and things of that sort for the last few days, so it would be nice for them to have a line of people to show them gratitude. I personally want to thank Mass LA for this incredible convention and the work that they do outside of this convention, all of the shiuch and scholars and, and influencers and activists that have spoken before me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of that work. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, I don't intend this talk to be dominated by our current American politics, but I actually want to share something that I hope inshallah ta'ala will lead into this discussion of what it means to pass the torch and what it means to maintain an identity. In December of 2008, one month after Barack Obama was elected president in New Orleans, Louisiana, a group of leftover members from the Ku Klux Klan decided to burn crosses on a few families' lawns, black families' lawns that lived in predominantly white neighborhoods. They didn't burn anyone on those crosses. They didn't attack the people inside the home. They didn't firebomb the homes. But they burned those crosses on a few families' homes' lawns to send a message that the ideology that defines our domestic and foreign policy here in the United States of white supremacy is still alive and well, and that it will not be uprooted by a black president, that a black president could not change an essentially white supremacist system, and it was an act of resistance against the symbol, I'm not even talking about Barack Obama's policies or what he actually changed or what he was actually able to accomplish or speaking to his platform, but the symbol of a man that they thought threatened the essential nature of what they wanted the country to remain and be. And it kind of blew my mind, and I remember the first time, I'm from Louisiana, the other LA, and growing up 
I used to always get confused when I'd write my address because I didn't know whether to put a dot between the L and the A or not and uh, what exactly that meant. And I remember the first time I saw a Ku Klux Klan rally and I thought to myself, hmm, that's interesting. Why are they burning crosses in the middle of nowhere and gathering around wearing bed sheets, looking like a bunch of fools and somehow manifesting power? I thought it was silly when I first saw it. And I thought to myself, what is it about these people? What's so, why are they doing that? What are they trying to prove when they get together in a place of those of you that are familiar with Louisiana, the biggest Klan rally would happen in Denham Springs, in a place like Denham Springs. What, what are they doing out in the middle of nowhere, a bunch of grown men, you know, burning crosses and chanting certain things all to themselves? Fast forward to this last year in the conversation about Confederate memorials and Confederate statues that exist in our country and whether or not those Confederate statues should continue to remain up. Now, to a lot of Muslims and to a lot of people, you know, the common observer, what's the big deal? It's a bunch of statues, it's a bunch of stones, let's actually work on people, let's work on real policy. What's the big deal? And I think that which is a discussion for another day, as Muslims, we have truly underestimated the danger of white supremacy in this country, and we've been asleep on it for a very long time, and we don't understand the theological manifestations of it, the social manifestations of it, the political manifestations of it, the cultural manifestations of it, and how it's really poisoned all of our spaces and hindered our progress as a nation. And so to a lot of people, it's like, what's the big deal? It's a bunch of statues. In Dallas, Texas, that debate raged on and the confederate memorials in dallas texas actually surround city hall huge i mean gigantic statues idols of white supremacy that were erected after the confederates lost who erects an idol after a loss like could you imagine someone losing a battle and they put up flags all around the city and put up idols all around the city to their generals what was the point of that? It was to basically say that even though the Confederates had lost militarily, the ideology that they espoused would continue. And it would remain the dominant ideology that would shape our policies at all levels of government. And so having those idols standing up, particularly in areas where policies are made, is a symbol of continuity. That it is still enshrined in our nation's very being, in its essential being. And white supremacy is not just a loud white supremacist that's on TV, that's shouting, uh, you know, what they call now white nationalist sentiments. It's not just that. At the end of the day, it's 96% of the wealthiest Americans being white or over 80% of Congress remaining white, or every president except for one remaining white. It's to be enshrined in all of these different things, and a lot of times we don't see it because we focus on the outcome and we focus on the way that things are spoken and said, and we don't take a moment to step back and say what they represent and actually pay attention to what they represent. The idea is continuity of something. The idea is that this ideology be enshrined in the elements that matter most. The idea is that it will continue. So it was never about the people that were being put on the crosses, the burning crosses. It was that the ideology that burns people on crosses continues to burn people economically through the criminal justice system, through all of these different layers of government and policy making that exist and continues to dominate all of the different layers of so, our social makeup as a country. That's what it really was all about. Now all of that is about white supremacy, and my talk is not about white supremacy. I just wanted to focus on one element. Why is it so important to a people to maintain the symbols? Why is it so important to a people, even if we're talking about a toxic ideology and a poisonous ideology, and certainly we would not put our religious identity in the same category as that ideology, but why is it so important that those crosses burn, that those robes still exist, that those flags still fly high, that those statues and memorials still remain, that the thought of removing those things from the public sight 
elicit such a violent political reaction, such a vicious reaction. Because the idea is that continuity of that ideology is so important to those people that any thought of removal of those symbols threatens the ideology that allows them to dominate and allows them to remain in that place. What does this mean for Muslims and how do we actually take a step back and let's put the political on the side for a moment. What does it mean to maintain an identity in a society? What does it mean to maintain a place in society? What does it mean to maintain the ability to, to define oneself in society? What does it mean to be able to still have the agency to say what your identity is rather than have someone else mold an identity for you and demand that you fit into it because of the conclusions that they have derived about your religion or about who you are. What exactly does that mean? And how do we understand continuity in our conception? What does continuity mean to us? The Prophet said that there would come a time that people would say, La ilaha illallah. And when they're asked why they say La ilaha illallah, there is no substance to it. They got to the end, they maintained the slogan, they maintained the symbol, they maintained saying La ilaha illallah. But when they're asked why they say La ilaha illallah, the only thing they can put forward is that, well, we used to hear our parents saying La ilaha illallah. And so it was just important to maintain the statements of La ilaha illallah, but the substance of it, the content of it, the implications of monotheism, not just the theological implications, but the societal implications of monotheism were, are lost at that point. And so the Prophet ﷺ actually taught us that we have to pay attention to the roots. We have to pay attention to the content. We have to pay attention to the substance. And when we talk about passing a torch from a Muslim perspective of an ideology, of an identity, of a being, of an existence that is not just beneficial in the ideal sense to those that maintain that identity, but beneficial to everyone around those people that are so fulfilled by their Islam that they act on it in the fullness of its mercy and what it brings to everyone and everything around them. What does that exactly mean? And I go back to Surah Al-Baqarah. And you think about Ibrahim alayhi salam. And there's a very powerful moment of Ibrahim salam not erecting an idol, but instead building the Kaaba, putting something up at the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not really knowing the extent to which this Kaaba is going to shape an ummah. Not knowing the amount of visitors that will come, not knowing how many of Allah's worshippers will long for it, whether they actually get to go there physically or not, their hearts remain attached to it, not knowing how many people would have the picture of the Kaaba on their walls, not knowing how many people would admire not just the structure, but the meaning of that structure and the fact that there are all these people that are in constant tawaf, in constant circling, circling of that Kaaba, maintaining the place of that Kaaba, not knowing any of that. All he knows is that Allah commanded him to build the Kaaba. And Allah commanded him to build the Kaaba in a place that is completely abandoned. It has no beaches. It has no vegetation. Believe it or not, that clock tower is new. It wasn't there in the time of Ibrahim Some of you are not laughing. You're like, really? You know, so. The clock tower is new. The hideous structures are new. A lot of that stuff is new. In fact, all of that stuff is new. The Starbucks wasn't there. The McDonald's wasn't there. All of those things are actually pretty recent uh, establishments or, or, or stores that, that were put up there. But Ibrahim is commanded to build the Kaaba in a place where no one is, not being given the full extent to which the influence of that Kaaba is going to shape the history of the world after him. Just told Allah commands you to build that Kaaba. Allah commands you to start with the foundation. And it's very beautiful that Ibrahim alayhi salam 
is raising a foundation that existed before him. He takes his son and he does not use his own ijtihad, his own reasoning to come up with a place to where he should erect that Kaaba, but instead you're raising a foundation because something was already there, and that is the place where Allah Azawajal commanded the angels to build a, a, a home of worship with Adam alayhi salam from the very beginning of mankind. So Ibrahim salam and his son are commanded to raise the foundations. We don't know at what point the Kaaba was really lost between Adam alayhi salam and Ibrahim alayhi salam. We don't know where the drop-off happened, where the loss of identity happened, where the loss of the importance of the Kaaba happened. We know that the Prophet ﷺ told us that other prophets came before and they made Hajj too. They visited the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And imagine the sight. The Prophet ﷺ talking about Hud, Salih, Musa, salam, great prophets of Allah that at some point in their lives made their way to the Kaaba and made tawaf, Hud and Salih existing before Ibrahim alayhi salam. So we don't know at what point it dropped off and the Kaaba lost its significance, but what we do know is that the loss of the significance of the Kaaba was the culmination of the loss of the importance of Tawheed, the loss of the importance of the identity that had the Kaaba established in the first place. And that's how it became an abandoned place, an abandoned desert to where Ibrahim salam and Ismail salam are commanded to raise the foundation, to build something back up after it's been lost for Allah knows how many generations and how many decades and how many, maybe even hundreds of years. And so Ibrahim salam, imagine the site of his son Ismail salam, start to build this home. And as they are building this house, as they're building this house together, raising the foundation, stacking the bricks on each other. Ibrahim salam and Ismail finish that glorious job. And then Ibrahim salam starts to make a dua. Think about Mecca right now and think about just the simple Kaaba and Ibrahim and Ismail raising their hands together and making dua. What a beautiful sight. Their hands raised. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ O oh, our Lord, accept from us where you are the all-hearing, the all-knowing. First and foremost, the idea of acceptance. I don't know what the outcome of this action is, but I know that if it was a command from you, then it's noble, and the intention has to match it in its nobility. So, O oh Allah, accept from us. And Ismail, his son, saying, Ameen. O oh Allah, accept from us. You're the all-hearing, you're the all-knowing. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا Or I actually skipped an ayah. رَبَّنَا وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَدْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Or did I mix it up again? I had it right the first time. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ Then calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's a lot easier to do this in salah by the way uh, To read it in sequence Calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He says, and O oh our Lord Let us ourselves Be amongst those who are Muslim Who submit to you and let that be the culture, let that be the identity of that which shapes our descendants. And show us the proper way to worship you. Show us the proper rituals. What you want us to do with this symbol. What you want us to do with this house. And you are the one who is always accepting of repentance and always forgiving. Meaning we don't just want to build this Kaaba and figure out what to do with it. Teach us, O oh Allah, the rituals. Teach us what we're supposed to be doing with it. Teach us the fullness of its substance. What it means and what it means to honor that which you are honoring and sanctify that which you are sanctifying. And then he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a messenger amongst his descendants. He doesn't specify when. He doesn't say to Allah, Oh Allah, you know, make sure I, I want to see this descendant in my own lifetime. Just send a descendant who will uphold that original meaning as well. So it's really interesting because Ibrahim is asking for clarity of the meaning himself first. 
Give us clarity by showing us properly how to do the rituals. And then send a prophet later on because it's been lost before. There was once clarity here and it's been lost once before. So when that loss takes place again, send a prophet, a messenger from my descendants who will revive it in the fullness of that clarity. And Allah is surely capable of doing so. That once and for all, because we are in this constant roller coaster, constantly trying, to, you know, sometimes we have our ups, sometimes we have our highs, sometimes, so sometimes we have our lows. We're always between these two things. So surely some generations are going to fail to uphold it. So show us clarity and then send someone from our descendants that will restore it to its clarity if that clarity becomes lost once again, which it surely does in the way that things continue to take place. What Allah is telling us about Ibrahim salam is profound. And by the way, we usually stop at this part. We usually don't go beyond this when we're talking about the tafsir of these ayat. What Allah is telling us about Ibrahim salam is profound. That Ibrahim salam did not bother, for one, to take a pen and to etch into the stones Ibrahim was here, or Ismail was here. He wasn't concerned with the continuity of his name. That's why Allah honored it so much. But he was concerned with the continuity of Allah's name being glorified. And that's why Allah answered his supplication. I'm going to say that again. Ibrahim was not concerned about people mentioning Ibrahim salam or ascribing all of this to Ibrahim salam after he's gone. He wasn't concerned about his own individual legacy. He didn't want a plaque. He didn't want the recognition. He was concerned about the cause. And when you're concerned about the cause, Allah honors you and Allah furthers the cause through you, which is the greatest honor. When you're concerned about your own lowly self, Allah humiliates you and Allah gives the cause to someone who's more worthy of bearing it. It's special that Allah then honored Ibrahim salam through the Kaaba, through that structure that he built, through the message that he implemented, that Ibrahim and Mecca are inseparable to us. Ibrahim and Salah, prayer, where Ibrahim salam wanted a people that would continue to establish the prayer after him, are inseparable. Because Ibrahim saw beyond himself, and he saw a cause. He saw a torch that needed to be passed, not just five years down the line, not just ten years down the line, but that would continue to exist. And that would light in a way that the clarity of its original intent would remain. Because even Quraysh did tawaf, but they did it without clothes and with idols. So sometimes the original intent is lost and it can be a defeating purpose that overtakes the, uh, the quality of that worship later on. So Ibrahim Islam had that clarity and he wanted to make sure Allah sent someone that would revive that clarity later on. Now here's the thing. Ibrahim Islam also had that long-term vision. But in the process of having that long-term vision, Ibrahim Islam did not lose sight of short-term goals. And this is what I said about going on to the next few ayahs. وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَ نَفْسَهُ وَلَقَدْ اسْتَقَيْنَاهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَإِنَّهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ لَمِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Allah praises Ibrahim alayhi salam in summarizing this episode. Then Allah takes us to a very intimate moment. First it was Ibrahim and his son building for the future. And when they're talking about the future, they're not just talking about Ismail's future or Ismail's kids or the generation that they would live to encounter in some capacity. They're talking way beyond, they're talking about us. Ibrahim salam is talking about us. Coming to the Kaaba with the same clarity of message that he had when he passed that torch down to his son Ismail and that it would continue to get passed and that there would not be a permanent loss of purpose. But maybe only a temporary departure. And that Allah would send a prophet that would restore its purpose for good in its full clarity. But you know what Allah takes us to now? وَوَصَّابِهَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَبَنِيهِ وَيَعْقُوبِ Ibrahim in his dying moments, talking to his children. Now if you've ever been around dying people, 
It's a profound experience. Because you hear certain things when people are dying. The, do, the, the one who's dying sees certain things and says certain things, right? There's a lot that comes out at the time of death. That's why Allah Azza wa taught us to seek Hasn al Khitam, a good ending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all a good ending. Allahumma ameen. Allah takes us to Ibrahim alayhi salam sitting with his children and his grandson. Enjoining his son and enjoining his grandchildren. Ya baniya inna Allah astafa lakum al-deen fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Listen, my children, my grandchildren, my family, Allah has chosen for you this message. Allah has chosen for you this way of life. Do not die except upon this way of life, except maintaining a clear identity and clarity of purpose. Don't lose it. Your time will come just like my time is coming. Don't lose this amana. And this is special because a lot of times, you know, people that are very vision oriented, sometimes tend to miss the imminent priorities that are right in front of them. Ibrahim was thinking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what comes after him in us, but he's not losing sight of his own children and what's directly in front of him and talking to them with that imminent priority. Listen, you need to make sure you maintain this. And by the way, he's not talking to some kids that went off and started doing some crazy stuff and he was worried about it. And Ibrahim Islam found a local imam and asked him to put the Holy Spirit on him and make him religious again. He never had to complain about Ismail. He never had to complain about his, his grandson Yaqub. He never had bad kids. They're anbiya, they're prophets of Allah. Of course they're going to die Muslim because they're prophets of Islam. Like what, what would make you fear the loss of identity in prophets who are prophets of Islam? But Ibrahim is emphasizing to them what? Don't lose yourself in the process of your greater mission. Maintain your roots. Maintain your iman. Maintain your faith. Keep it all as you go through the noble great causes that you have. Don't lose yourself. While you're cultivating greatness in the world, don't forget to cultivate greatness in your living room. While you're cultivating greatness in your family, don't forget to cultivate greatness in your heart at night when no one is watching you and it's just you and your Lord. Don't lose yourselves. And you will one day be passing on this baton to your children. I'm leaving this world and I'm giving you that torch. And I have hope that Allah will produce an outcome that is permanent from my descendants thousands and thousands of years from now. But you don't lose it. Hold on to it. What's the very next ayah? It's beautiful. It's truly profound because you don't, you don't see this except for the family of Ibrahim salam in the Quran. Allah says, أَمْ كُنْتُمْ شُهَدَاءِ الْحَضَرِ يَعْقُوبَ الْمَوْتِ Fast forward a few years, now it's his grandson, Jacob, Yaqub on the deathbed. And he's talking to his kids. And he's saying to his kids, مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِنْ بَعْدِي Let me hear it from you. What, you. what will you worship after me? Will you retain the clarity of purpose, the clarity of identity, that pure tawheed, that pure message after me? Are you going to lose your identity? Are you going to lose the substance of that identity? And how do they affirm it to Ya'qub as he's dying? We worship your Lord. And the Lord of your father, Ibrahim, your grandfather, your uncle, your, you know, Ismail, Ishaq, your father, because they are all fatherly ancestral in what they are passing down of that message. We will worship the same thing that they taught you to worship. We know that you were once advised and, and had this torch passed on the way that you are passing it on to us and we will honor that our father. Allah takes us then to Yusuf alayhi salam. And the Prophet said, who is more noble than Yusuf alayhi salam, than Joseph, peace be upon him. He's the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet, the son of a prophet. Yusuf, the son of Ya'qub, the son of Ishaq, the son of Ibrahim. What a noble family, what a noble lineage to have. Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. And Allah takes us to his deathbed and his moment. And subhanAllah, what is the first thing he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or what's the, the, the finality of his request in his last dying moments? 
tawaffani musliman. Let me die a Muslim. Let me die with the fullness of that purpose and identity. Walhiqni bi salihin. And follow and be followed by the righteous. Some of the scholars broaden the interpretation of that verse to also speak to the successors, not just the predecessors. Let me join those who went before me, who held that torch before me, and let me be succeeded by those who carry on that torch as well. What it shows you is that as these people were transforming the world, they weren't neglectful of their own living rooms. And while they were with their own children, the most important thing that they could think of as they were leaving this world was that their children would maintain the continuity of purpose. Will you still remain upon this after I am gone? The great grandson, great 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 grandson of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he was on his deathbed, what gave him joy? What gave him happiness? Was it the people crying outside? His room was it the idea that we will build your tomb? No, the Prophet said, Don't take my grave as a eat. I don't want you to build me a structure. I don't want you to put any I don't want you to put any special things on top of my structure, on top of my grave. I don't want you to celebrate me in some superficial way where you mention my name but you forget the purpose of my coming. I don't want any of that. Don't do that. Instead, what did the Prophet say? As the last moment that Anas ibn Malik anhu mentioned the Prophet وسلم, opening his curtain and looking out at the companions as they were praying. And the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم, looked at his companions in prayer and his face lit up with joy brighter than a page of the Mus'haf because the Prophet وسلم, saw continuity. He saw the torch had been passed, that they were praying even though he was not leading them in prayer. And that was the point. And that's why, We have elevated your mention, your name, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because you put your head down on your riding animal as you marched into Mecca with the same spirit of humility and the same dedication to cause that your father Ibrahim alayhi salam had when he built that house that you're about to purify. You deserve to be honored and you are a worthy carrier of that cause. And those that honor the cause in your spirit and carry it to those that will come after them in its purity and clarity will be worthy of a similar honor and recognition from Allah He understood. That's what the Prophet needed to see. It wasn't when the Sahaba looked at the Prophet with anticipation that there's Allah because that's what happened. Anas said, we thought he was coming back out to lead us. That's not what made him smile. What made him smile was when they were praying despite the Prophet not leading him, not leading them. It will continue. The torch will be passed. What does it mean to pass that torch? And you find SubhanAllah how personal these companions took it. The vast majority of the legacy we have of the Prophet ﷺ comes through the Prophet ﷺ giving a very personal advice to somebody. And sometimes, what would otherwise be deemed generic in the context of a sermon is life-changing in the context of personal advice. How many of the hadiths that we have of the Prophet ﷺ come from the khutbahs of the Prophet ﷺ, the speeches of the Prophet ﷺ? And how many of them come from the Prophet ﷺ having a very personal conversation with his nephew, with his brother, with his sisters, with his children, his grandchildren, about what this amana truly was, about what this trust truly was? Ibn Abbas sitting on the back of a, of, of a camel while the Prophet وسلم, is leading in front of him and the Prophet وسلم, turns away and says, Ya Ghulam, inni wa'alimuka bi kalimah. Oh my, oh young man, let me teach you some words. Ihfadullah yahfadhk until the end of the hadith. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah. Tajidu tajahat yuhfadhk. 
in front of you. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ وَإِذَا سَتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعَنْ بِاللَّهِ If you ask, ask of Allah. If you seek help, seek help from Allah. Know that if everyone in the world was to try to benefit you with something, they would not benefit you with something unless Allah has written it for you. And if they all gather together to harm you with something, they would not harm you with anything unless Allah has written it against you. The pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. If Ibn Abbas heard that in a khutbah, do you think it would have had the same effect on his life, the same impact on his life? But instead, every single time he encounters an incident that takes place in his life that falls within one of those dictates, he's going to go right back to that personal advice. That someone cared enough about me to sit with me and say, listen, you have a responsibility, oh young man. Listen, you've got, a, you've got a legacy that you have to uphold. You have a special message that's been given to you. And you will be made capable so long as you put that cause before yourself. That's important. How much of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, how much of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ comes from the living room of Aisha radiallahu anha. Sitting with her nephew, Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu anhuma. And Urwa asking Aisha about the Prophet ﷺ in his most personal life. And Aisha radiallahu anha making it a point, our mother, to deliver each and every single element of his life to us with full clarity. That when they portray our Prophet wasallam in a way that is not true to his character, we have a tradition, we have a flawless legacy that we can show and we can say, you know what, the way you are characterizing him is not him. This is who he was wasallam. It came in the context of that personal imparting of that identity, imparting of that message. It was in the living room. Brothers and sisters, I go any further about what it means to cultivate that identity. I want us to question ourselves about something that I think is very important. As a community, how many of our leaders, how many of our influencers, how many of those that have bore the church of Islam can we honestly say we have cultivated from within? Sometimes, Sometimes, not all of them. I don't want to be absolutist. We act like leeches. We wait for someone to go figure it out in the world around them. We expect them to get by with the poor message experience that we gave to them and the constant criticism and hierarchy and bureaucracies that existed within the Muslim community. The lack of encouragement that was instead a lot of discouragement about what they should not do. And then once they went and figured it out and achieved some sort of significance outside of the community, we bring them right back to our stages and celebrate them as if we made them. You didn't pass a torch to them. You brought them after they lit their own torch and claimed them because it was convenient for the moment. And as soon as that moment passed, you tore them back down and sent them right back out to the world around you to go figure it out for the rest of their lives. That's not our deen. That's not a snap. That's not how we're going to produce generations of torchbearers and leaders. Let me tell you something. I am in part a product of mass. I remember some of the transformative words and moments within a or within a camp. Those had an effect on me. They had a life-changing impact on me that would not have come in the capacity of a YouTube video. That would not have come in the format of a Facebook post. It's got to be a little personal. There has to be a community that breeds that type of greatness, that imparts that type of responsibility upon those that come after them. There has to be a family that breeds that, that, breeds that, that, that fire within their children's hearts, that imparts that sense of amana and makes it clear that this is the most important thing in the world to us, that we are not here to fulfill our lowly selves or to entertain ourselves. We're here for a mission. We're here for a sense of purpose. We're not here to stroke our own egos. We're not here to receive accolades to our names when both our names and those accolades will become insignificant in the years that come and possibly a testimony against us on the Day of Judgment. That's not what we're here for. Will you maintain your roots? Will you maintain
maintain your identity? Will you maintain your cause? Now, if you broaden that concept to who we are right now as an American Muslim community, and what this will mean going forward, Sister Jaya had said something that was actually at the Aqib banquet uh, that we had, I've lost track of time, I think two weeks ago, um, at our annual banquet. And SubhanAllah, she mentioned something that we actually came to recognize a few years ago, which was part of the foundation of Yaqeen, that the target of Islamophobia is not other than us. At the end of the day, if we lose our own sense of being, our own sense of identity, our own sense of purpose, and become satisfied with American Muslim with a capital A and a lowercase m and embrace an identity that's been molded for us that relinquishes essential elements of our message, then and only then can we exist in this society. And so you allow the same people that are trying to impose a racist definition of American on America to impose a neutered definition of Islam on the Muslims. To impose an Islam on us that does not threaten power structures. And I have to give this disqualifier, I don't mean with violence. That does not offer any meaningful challenge to the systems that exist around us. That is so diluted that it is essentially unrecognizable. Unless someone says that they're Muslim or displays some sort of a symbol that would show that they are Muslim. That is lost at its roots. That is lost in its meaning. That doesn't offer anything different to society. And I want you to understand this because it's very important. The Prophet when he received that message of Islam, and he went to Waraqa, and he said to Waraqa that, I've been visited by this presence, and Waraqa told him that was Jibreel alayhi salam, and Waraqa told him that I wish I was young enough to support you when your people run you out, when your people persecute you. When the Prophet some said, would they really run me out? Would they really persecute me? Would they really turn on me? What the Prophet some was saying was, an outstanding citizen of Mecca. I've done everything right by my people. I've done everything that offers comfort to people. I've been there for people, no matter who they were, what tribe they belonged to, what creed they espoused. I've always been there for people. People love me here. They know that I'm there for them. They know that I do good. Brought it back to what? Waraka said, no one has ever been given this message before except that their people ran them out and persecuted them and oppressed them. What that meant was, it's not about you as a person, it's about what you represent now. And if what you represent challenges systems of oppression, exploitation, challenges things that are predatory in your society, challenges people to live in a different way, challenges the values and ethics of society, infringes on an identity that has been crafted to cover for the most lowly of pursuits, then you are a threat even if you did not intend to be a threat. You're problematic. Even if you never wanted to be problematic. And so let's ditch this idea for a moment that if we all be good doctors and good lawyers and good engineers that everyone's going to love us and everything's going to be okay. They'll love you as an American Muslim doctor, as an American Muslim engineer, as an American Muslim lawyer, as an American Muslim congressperson, as an American Muslim city councilman, as an American Muslim imam, as an American Muslim whatever, so long as the M on Muslim is lowercase. And you're willing to accept a definition of your identity that's not true to its essential nature. They'll take you then, as long as you don't define yourself, as long as you accept the conclusions, as long as you accept to stop using words that they have deemed problematic because of the Islamophobia industry that has assigned certain definitions to those words. As long as you are willing to turn your back on parts of your divine scripture and things that are rooted deeply in your identity and your tradition, as long as you're willing to look over that, ahlan wa sahlan. I think it's really fun to fly back into the country.
country and you know they start playing all the welcome messages. But customs never says Ahlan wa Sahlan or Marhaba to me. It's never CPP is never welcoming. But you know what? The idea is you will be welcomed in your nature so long as you don't offer a challenge. So long as you don't offer a challenge. And there's this idea that we have as Muslims sometimes, which is the counter of that, which is to hyper preserve that the only Islam, the only way we can deal with this then, because we're so problematic with our Islam, is that we need to duck off and duck the storm and wait for another group to be picked on them. So there are two options. Either we hyper assimilate, lose our identity, let them define our religion for us, let our children about their identity and Malcolm X said only a fool allows his enemy to teach his children about his history. Either you accept that and you fully assimilate, fully acclimate, fully accept all the definitions of Islam and what it means to be a Muslim and what it means to be an ideal and upstanding citizen or you hyper preserve. You have to go into your cage. Go into your masjids, huddle, make sure that you preserve every element of your identity so long as we're praying, so long as we're eating halal meat, so long as we're observing the month of Ramadan properly, so long as we're doing these set of things and our rituals are intact in this regard, then we can maintain the trueness of our identity. And here's the challenge that I have to that, because that's also a very unhealthy way of thinking about imparting an identity. That the only way to do so is to super conserve, isolate, try to maintain some level of a flow. Number one, you're gonna find that there are going to be less and less people that are willing to go into isolation. And so that's gonna be self-defeating too. And I hate to break it to you, but all the hadiths about taking to, uh, you know, taking to the valleys and raising sheep, that's not the, this is not the fitna, the time of fitna the Prophet Sallallahu was talking about. You don't get to take to the valleys and raise sheep yet unless you really like to raise sheep and it's part of your profession and you want to be a farmer. But that's not the way that you're going to save your faith right now. You'll find less and less people that are willing to do that. Because at the end of the day, people want to function in their societies. No one wants to be an outcast. No one wants to be ostracized, looked at as different, alienated, excluded from their own political determination, excluded from their own uh, aspirations, societally, culturally. No one wants to be excluded from that stuff. So where is that middle ground? And here's the challenge. There is no Islam that exists without contribution. Your identity is also flawed, and that which you're trying to preserve, if it is restricted, to a point that it doesn't offer benefit to the societies around you, what type of identity are you trying to preserve in the first place? What are you actually trying to hold on to? And so if the Islam that you're trying to hold on to is restricted to ritual and becomes a set of don'ts, then that screams insecurity. And every insecure ideology in a melting pot will go very quickly, will immediately negotiate itself just out of survival. There is no Islam with that. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ You are the best of people produced for the people. You know, America first can mean two different things. There's Donald Trump's America first, and then there's the America first that uh, those who wanted us to believe that America was leading the world in good put forth. There's the America first as in our own first. Take the country back from who? Uh, we have to preserve our own identity, nationalistic, isolationist, only when it's convenience, right? You know, deal with everything around you only in the context of your own interests. That's called greed. That has nothing to do with uh, actual you know, well-being or the actual goodwill to a society or to a country or to a community. There's no such thing as a Muslim's first in that conception. There is no such thing as an idea in which Muslims, that the only options that we have are either to accept that which has been packaged for us or to go into hiding so that we can preserve even amongst the few people and to just pass it on in some convoluted way and just maintain certain rituals that are make, our, make ourselves feel better that we're maintaining the 
essence of our Tawheed, the essence of our monotheism, there is a middle ground. There is something in between. Because what Allah tells us in the Quran is that you are already betraying your identity if you are not out there for the people enjoining good and forbidding evil. You're already in betrayal of your identity. So the idea of hyper-preservation, let's shut off from society, let's keep it amongst ourselves, is a flawed identity. What you are maintaining is a betrayal already. It's already insecure. It's already a failure. Insecurity drives that isolation, just as insecurity drives that hyper-assimilation. They're both driven by insecurity, and they both represent a lack of being rooted. And that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, that legacy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us. So you want to be true to your identity? Show me how you're enjoying good and forbidding evil. When the only discussions of Islam and activism become, what's haram about activism? What does that say about your Islam? When the only discussion about how Islam engages society is about what you can't do as a Muslim in society, what does that say about how you view Islam's place in the world and a Muslim's place in their society? When the only discussion about negotiation of identity is always about how we make sure that we duck the radar, that we stay off, that we stay out of people's eyes. What is it about your identity that you're actually trying to preserve? What Islam is that? What does that say about it? And when your only discussion about ethics and Islam and the world around you is what's un-Islamic about some of the ethics putting forward, are you suggesting that Islam is stagnant now? That our tradition is stagnant? That our tradition that gave us the great people in the past that we lift and we amplify, the traditions from Andalusia and Adol al Uthmaniya, are you suggesting that that religion, that cause that gave life to so much has reached a point of stagnation that it can't speak to anything else in society today? That it has nothing to say about the way the world functions today? What Islam is that? What does that have to do with the Islam of the Prophet and the type of world that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions were able to shape in the framing of that Tawheed, of that monotheism. And it's really interesting here because some of the ulama of Tafsir, they pointed out, and I'm, I'm at the end of my talk, they pointed out this, that what Allah describes in any good work or in any action or in any victory or in any defeat is the importance of the retention of that identity. Some of the scholars said that is the wisdom of Allah saying, And you believe in Allah. Meaning, that in the process of engaging the society around you, and enjoying good, in forbidding evil, in doing all that you're doing for the people you retain, you do all of that while you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting because it's the same sequence that Allah uses when He spoke to the Muslims after Uhud. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَهِنُ وَلَا تَحْسَنُ وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't be discouraged, don't be afraid, don't fear. So long as, what? So long as you were able to retain your belief through the process. Because we believe that Allah is in charge of the outcome. And Allah has charged us with the process. You know what that means with torch bearing? Don't focus on the lights. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَاللَّهُ تِمُّ نُورِي Allah will maintain the light of that torch. Whether it's us bearing that torch in society or not, the torch will remain lit because Allah has said that it will remain lit. Whether we are the ones deemed worthy enough of carrying that torch, maintaining the fullness of our Islamic identity with its conviction and with its contribution, whether it's us or someone else, someone's going to be made worthy to carry that torch. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds us to be among those people. We're not distracted by the light and the torch because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain it. We're too distracted by the weight of the torch to focus on the light of the torch. And the weight of that torch is a lot heavier than those tiki torches in Charlottesville. These are serious torches. This is a serious amount, a serious trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us. That you're here for something greater than yourself. Will you work in accordance with that? And what are you willing to cultivate?
cultivate in your communities, in your families, in your masajid, in the spaces that Allah has given you space? What are you cultivating in your own hearts? And what are you cultivating amongst the people around you? Your brothers and sisters, I want to conclude with this part. Again, there is no Islam without foundational tenets of it. And without the fullness of the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and, 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 and the, the history that we have that's been deemed sacred. So an identity that exists without it is failure. It's loss. And there is no Islam without the contribution of Islam that offers shade to everyone around, that offers fruits that everyone can taste, that offers benefit to everything around it. That's also a faulty and flawed Islam. What Allah commands us to do is to maintain the roots and to maintain the fruits. To maintain the rootedness of that conviction, to not lose ourselves, to not let someone else define your identity. To not let someone else tell you what your Islam should look like, what your Muslim should look like, what your American should look like. And then, on top of that, to be willing to take Islam to the streets. To be willing to show what faith looks like in action. I'm sick and tired of every discussion of Islam and activism being about what's wrong with activism. What about what's right with Islam? Do you... I mean, subhanAllah, do you really need an ayah or a hadith or a fatwa to tell you that you should do something about the homelessness around you? Do you really need someone to tell you that there is something wrong with the police brutality that's so prominent in front of your face, that there is something wrong with people being exploited in the way that they are being exploited? Do you really need a fatwa for that? Do you really need an article for that? That's part of your core identity that the Muslim always sees the world around them in the spirit of khidmah, in the spirit of service, in the spirit of doing something to change it. And here's how we we'll distinguish ourselves as Muslims that are also Muslim Americans. Here's how we will distinguish ourselves as American Muslims. We're not going to distinguish ourselves as American Muslims by having the status of a minority group that's just treated like another cute element to the great diversity that we have in America that we, in reality, don't celebrate. We're not going to, that's not progress. By assigning ourselves that identification and putting ourselves in that bucket as a minority group that simply is trying to get ahead like every other minority, that's not how we're going to distinguish ourselves as an American Muslim community. We're not going to distinguish ourselves as an American Muslim community if a hundred years from now we're still allowed to be American Muslims, but American Muslims without Islam. That still maintain the culture, that still maintain some of the, the wordings of Islam, but have lost the substance. That by the time we got there, we're just like those Quraysh doing tawaf around the Kaaba, who were really doing tawaf around their idols. That's not the type of American Muslim that's going to succeed. That's not the type of Islam that's going to succeed in this country. Let me tell you what type of American Muslim community succeeds. It's a type of community that goes out there and engages the world around us with complete self-fulfillment, with paradigms that are unique to the society around us, and doing the work that we are all called collectively to do that is universally good, but doing it with a special level of ihsan, with a special level of excellence. Yes, we will find people that will fight poverty, but Muslims should be fighting poverty like no other person is fighting poverty because the Prophet ﷺ compared poverty to kufr. He said if you hate disbelief, you should hate poverty with that same energy, with that same spirit. If you want to eradicate disbelief and people associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, the, you want the purity of creed, you also need to be maintaining the purity of the dignity of a human being and trying to fight poverty in that same spirit. So yes, we're going to do things that are universally good, but we do them with a certain spirit that speaks to our prophetic tradition, that speaks to what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. There were other people that fought some of the universal injustices and upheld some of the common good that the Prophet ﷺ did, but the Prophet ﷺ distinguished himself in that process. And then again, what do we have to offer to the world without losing ourselves? 
Our deen is not stagnant. The same religion that gave life to Mecca and Medina can give life to Los Angeles and Dallas. The same way of life, the same cause, that same torch that was passed from Ibrahim السلام, in the barren deserts has meaning to us in this wilderness that we live in today. Do not, do not make the charge that your religion is only a set of prohibitions now. Honor the boundaries of your religion. Honor the prohibitions of the religion. But do not make the claim that the religion is only a set of prohibitions and don'ts. The religion is also a set of do's. And if you only focus on the do's or on the don'ts, you will become an inherently balanced person and we will have collectively an imbalanced identity. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to maintain that conviction and that contribution. To maintain the roots of the tree of faith as well as the fruits of the tree of faith. To be a community that is in the service of humanity without losing its foundational service to one God. To be a people that care enough about a cause over themselves that they will give it special attention and will make sure that they cultivate greatness in the name of that cause and in the spirit of that cause in their living rooms, in their places of worship, in their schools, and in the communities that are around them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deem us worthy of carrying that torch and allow us to live with that torch in our hands and allow us to die still holding on to that torch but passing it on and being a part of the continuity of this great tradition that we have, of this great identity that we have, of this great way of life that we have, of a way of life that offers solutions to the problems that are around us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us sincere throughout that process. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran wa sallam wa sallam wa sallam wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. So I have, to, I have to bring this back down. We'll say it one more time. Somebody was saying it's like beer.